Okay, everybody. Uh, by the way, I, I turned recording on. Um, good evening. I uh, hope everyone is well. Um, so, um, if you would all bow, I want to quick mute everybody just for the prayer, then we, then you can unmute us whenever you want. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us the guidance and the wisdom that it, it contains. May we open our hearts and our minds and our souls to your word and we always be uh, obedient and observant and aware of your word in our lives. May we help each other to work together through your word tonight and may we have great fellowship and may we learn and get closer to you, Lord. A lot of what our faith is about is about having a relationship with you, Lord, and um, it's just awesome that, that you provide us the opportunity to be in relationship with you, Lord, and we, we appreciate that. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to real, real quick. Um, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't say something about our Independence Day. So um, happy 4th of July, a day late on the 5th. Um, much like the grace of God uh, that God offers us, we should be thankful for our freedoms. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to mute everybody. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing a lot of crosstalk again. Um, okay. Um, we should be thankful for our freedoms, but woe be to us if we take them for granted. Um, much like if we should take um, God's offer for granted. Given the tensions and conflicts in our country today, I want to remind everybody that one of the recurring messages that we've been getting God throughout our study of Romans is he wants a relationship with us all. And I have that all capitalized, okay? And his offer of grace is available to all. And that all means all, no exceptions. God does not discriminate. Although we're all sinners, we're all taught that through God's word, uh, that we are uh, to do our best to emulate him, most notably his example of his son, Jesus Christ. We're taught to love and to forgive, and I think our country and our world could use a lot more of both of those right now. And that's not just for them. It's not just for those other people. It's not for someone else. That is a constant message to me, to you, and to all, capital A-L-L. <laughs> okay, so at any rate, um, uh, happy 4th of July, a day late, everybody. All right, so last week we covered uh, Romans 5, and I'm going to quick go through the highlights from that, because uh, it kind of sets the stage for, for chapter 6 like they usually do. So some of the things we hit last week was that God provides us a means of being in harmonious relationship with him through his graceful forgiveness of our sins. We're able to internally appreciate and externally express the joy and peace provided by God's grace and glory. We should look at the tribulations, persecutions, and other hard times that we will experience as equally joyous as the salvation being offered. And we talked a little bit about why that is. We should proudly proclaim the good news with our head held high. We bow to God, but we proclaim his good news with our heads held high. Christ died for our sins. He was resurrected to gracefully offer us salvation. Adam and Eve may have initially brought sin into the world, but we are responsible for our own sins. We can't blame them on anybody else. Sin may have come into this world through one man, uh, that is Adam, condemning all. But Christ, God in the, uh, the body of a man, one man, brought the offering of salvation as a free grace to all of us, all of us humans. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the real Cliff Notes version of Chapter 5. Um, today we'll study Chapter 6. Um, so I want you to, I hope you're very alert. If you need coffee, get it now, <laughs> because um, after we go through the usual reading through the chapter, um, when we go to the chapter, verses one and two uh, on the other end, um, it's going to get pretty intense pretty quick. So I'm just, just fair warning, okay? All right, so we'll open your Bibles, um, go to chapter six of Romans, and read along with me. And uh, if you're reading one of the more literal translations, this time the Young's won't be too far off. If you're reading the NIV or something else, it'll be a little bit different. Anyway, Romans 6, verse 1. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in the sin that the grace may abound? Let it not be. Who, we who died to the sin, how shall we still live in it? Are you ignorant that we, as many as were baptized to Christ Jesus, to his death were baptized? We were buried together then, with him through the baptism to the death, that even as Christ was raised up out of the dead through the glory of the Father, so also we, in newness of life, may walk. For if we have become planted together into the likeness of his death, so also shall we be of the rising again. This knowing that our old man, most of you will say our old self, was crucified with him, 
that the body of the sin may be made useless for our no longer serving the sin. For he who hath died hath been set free from the sin. And if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised up out of the dead, does no more die, death over him has no more lordship. For in that he died, to the sin he died once, and in that he liveth, he liveth to God. So also you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to the sin, and living to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not then the sin reign in your mortal body, to obey it in its desires. Neither present you your members instruments of unrighteousness to the sin, but present yourselves to God as living out of the dead, that your members instruments of righteousness to God. For sin over you shall not have lordship, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Let it not be. Have ye not known that to whom ye present yourselves servants for obedience? Servants ye are to him to whom you obey, whether to sin to death or obedience to righteousness. And thanks to God that ye were servants of the sin and were obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were delivered up. And having been freed from sin, you became servants to the righteousness. In the manner of men I speak, because of the weakness of your flesh, for even as you did present your member servants to the uncleanliness and to the lawless, to the lawlessness, so now present your member servants to the righteousness, to sanctification. For when you were servants of the sin, you were free from the righteousness. What fruits, therefore, were you having then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those is death. For now, having been freed from the sin and having become servants to God, you have your fruit to the sanctification and the end of life age during. For the wages of sin is death, and the gift of God is life age during in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, so as we work through this chapter, there's something I want you to kind of keep in the back of your mind, because um, we'll, we'll talk about it at the end. It's kind of a wrap-up. And the thing I want you to keep in the back of your mind is the question or issue is, what does it mean to be freed from sin and servants of God, stated in verse 22. I'm not going to dive into that now. We'll dive into it later. But I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind as we go through all this. Um, I want you to think about how that applies to the verses we'll be studying and vice versa. What do the verses say that lead to those statements? All right, so let's go back through the chapter. And like I said, we'll, we're going to dive in pretty deep right away. Um, all right, verses 1 and 2. What then shall we say? Shall we continue in the sin that the grace may abound? Let it not be. We who died to the sin, how shall we still live in it? Okay, so if we are all sinners, and I assume you all agree with me on that, how are we as Christians not still living in sin? And I don't want a simple platitude that we're all saved by grace and all that, which is true. That's, that's, I want to go deeper than that, okay? I want to go more deep, and I want to go more practical than that. What does that really mean to us, that if we are sinners, how are we not still living in sin? What does that really mean? Well, I'll, I'll get you started. Um, okay. We are, we are still sinners, but sin no longer has dominion over us. Sin no longer reigns over us. Uh, we... In a very real sense, we die to the love and the practice of sin. Um, it's not that we don't ever sin anymore. It's just that it, it's no longer our master. So, so there's been a change in status. So it makes absolutely no sense to keep on trying to to do more sin to get more grace. It, it's just a <laughs> because we died to that. Um, and then he goes on, of course, to explain the process of that. But uh, that'll at least get us started. Good start. Very good start, Mike. Thank you. Anybody else want to take it off from there? Okay, I have a number of thoughts here that I wanted to go through. Um, and they're all very much under the context of what Mike said, so I really appreciate that. Okay, um, first of all, we need to continually mature and repent of our sins, okay? It's kind of like peeling the onion back, right? Um, you get to the next level of possibly unrecognized sin and work on that, right? Because even as a mature Christian, I think one of the challenges that we all face isn't the stealing, you know, whoredom, you know, the, the big things that Paul always kind of, you know, rattles off, right? It's that 
wow, that wasn't a very kind thought I just had. You know, or I love that. I love uh, the, what was it? What you call it today? The preacher's um, story today, or this? Um, what happened here? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Um, I thought it was me. I lost you, but you're back, at least for me. Okay. Okay. All right. Anyway, so I love Mike's um, story today, um, and and I think that that's. Um, very apropos for what we're going through here today. Um, all right, um, and we need to look at our sins differently than we used to, right? Um, or at least differently than if we weren't Christians, right? We need to recognize sin to sin, uh, not make excuses. Uh, we need to admit to ourselves and to God and preferably to each other that we have sinned, right? Um, yeah, uh, Dan, go ahead. So the concept that grace could increase is a fallacy. <laughs> was his son Jesus Christ of Calvary's cross. What more can he do? I think that's a very fair point. It's kind of like, you know, you don't get baptized twice, right? I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> um, I think that's great. Yes, absolutely. All right. Okay, and then again, as mature Christians, we have to proactively take steps to repent from our sins and prevent ourselves, right? Um, a simple, I'll try not to do that again, isn't really going to get you much beyond spiritual infancy, right? We need to examine how and why and, and what steps we can change to change our behavior and so forth, right? Um, all right, and then we need to look at our sins and the sins of others as Jesus would, not as the world does, right? Um, the one exception I will make is that um, we don't judge anyone. Jesus gets to judge us, right? Jesus gets to judge me for my sins, okay? I don't get to judge you for your sins, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but other than that, we should look at it like Jesus, right? We forgive ourselves. We forgive others. We don't hold people or ourselves hostage to sins of others or our parents, our family, our friends, whatever, okay? Um, we don't, we, we just, we can't go there for other people. We have to approach sin as a teaching and learning moment, right? Not as a time for punishment and condemnation. And yes, I know we have to teach our children, which sometimes means punishing them. But, but generally, it, we should treat sin as a teaching and, and growing opportunity, not some kind of punishment and condemnation. We also don't look at sin um, of others as a way to gain advantage, to get leverage, to feel superior, right? Uh, or an opportunity, we should look at it as an opportunity to grow. Um, and also, we don't look at as, as, as uh, if I, yeah, I sin today, okay, right, whatever. Um, I don't look at it as, as the end of God's grace, right? Um, if we're servants to God, we're also part of the family of God, and we have to behave in according to that grace, right? And, and we have to, as Paul would say, keep on, you know, go through the race, race to the end, fight to the end, whatever, okay, right? But most importantly, um, we are now in direct relationship with God, right? Once, once you accept Jesus Christ, that is, is probably one of the biggest pieces of the, of the grace of God is, and that's why Christ was crucified, was so that we could have relationship with God. All right. Uh, let's go to verses three and four. And by the way, we will move faster from here on out. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, three and four. Are ye ignorant then, as many as were baptized to Christ Jesus, to his death were baptized? We were buried together then with him through the baptism of the death, that even as Christ was raised up out of the dead through the glory of the Father, so also we in newness of life may walk. Okay, so is Paul confusing us here? Were we baptized into Christ's death or his resurrection? What's, what's the deal here? Both, yeah, 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 exactly, right? Okay, so what is the basic message of the phrase and concept that we have died and been buried with Christ? Right, there's two pieces there. There's the, the, the death part, there's, the, there's the, the life enduring part. What is the basic message uh, of that to us in real life, in real time? What does that mean to us? I think well, Paul is reminding us the significance of of what this baptism is really representing, uh, just as as Christ died uh, for our sins, um, we have died too in a very real sense of dying to sin, dying to the love and the practice of sin, and and just as 
Jesus was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, uh, we are buried underneath the watery grave. And then Christ is raised to walk, was raised, um, and we're raised to walk a brand new person. And yes, they, yes. And that was what they needed most is to understand that you have died to your past. You, this is not you anymore. You are a new person, and you need to live that way. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, Dan. You know, we're very often we emphasize baptism for forgiveness of sins, which, of course, it is. And the scripture tells us that. But it's also a new life and a uniting with God and Christ. So baptism is much more than just an act of forgiveness of sin. Uh, we don't emphasize the new life as much as I think we could or should, but that's what the result of baptism should be. I agree. I think the whole thing is much more complex than we sometimes dress it as. Um, and I find it kind of interesting. Um, uh, and I think uh, Troy did an interesting thing today in, in communion. You know, we, we celebrate communion every single Sunday, right? Um, and it's, it's there as a reminder, but it's also because it's a, there's a million and one ways and a million and one lessons to learn from, from the death and the resurrection, right? It's, it's not that simple, right? There are some simple truths to it. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Dan. And I think the outcome of it all is um, is that was the key that gave us the opportunity to have a living, real relationship with God. Hey, David. Yes, Richard. Can you see me, or you cannot? I can't. We can't see ourselves tonight, so. No, uh, we can't see you. At least I can't. I can hear you. Yeah. And I see your screen, but I don't. I, I does anybody else see Richard? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so. I've played with it. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but anyway, I'm not worried about that. Did you not? Maybe you didn't brush your hair good enough. Yeah, yeah, it may be that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I, that, that probably is it. Okay, never mind. Uh, I don't know, Richard. These two, these, yeah. two passages, these two passages, though, also speak to me the same way the passages that talk about us being yoked with Christ. And I think this, you know, I, I think there's a real. Uh, as a new Christian, I don't think you realize what this really means when you first come out. And to me, I see that real yoked there. And if you're going to follow him, you're going to do all you can to avoid sin and to walk that new life. And because you don't, you know, you don't want the person you're yoked to doing all the dragging of you all of the time. So those passages that talk about yoking just uh, to me, this kind of reinforces that. Excellent. Gary. You know, when I think of newness of life, it's it's one of those things where, you know, how the teenagers have that enthusiasm for Christ when they come back from camp. It's how, you know, we are when we're first baptized, um, you know, and it's the way we should feel all the time. But it's interesting that sometimes it takes situations like that, you know, uh, you know, SunQuest or when the kids go to Gatlinburg and or when we used to have gospel meetings and you kind of came out all pumped and you felt that newness of life again and everything. And, and you know, we don't, while we should have that all of the time, we don't, um, it, it's not really pushed as much. It's, it's more on our own to do that sometimes. Yeah, it is, but you know it shouldn't be, right? Um, in fact, this is this is not really from the reading tonight, but I think this is a valid thing to talk about because you brought it up, and that's part of the, the fellowship. That's part of the brothers and sisters, right? Um, the reality is is that we don't maintain a constant level of of top of our game, you know, totally committed, right? Sometimes life gets to us, whatever it is, right? And we need to be there for each other. We need to recognize in each other because sometimes we don't recognize in ourselves. And, you know, Gary may name you come up and say, Frost, what are you doing? <laughs> What's wrong with you? You know, um, what can, and, and more importantly, what can I do to help? He, Gary would never do that, by the way. But, um, not, not in those words, but you get my point. 
Um, we need to watch out for each other. We need to have each other's backs as the expression is these days. Um, and no one needs to do that more and better than Christians do, I think. Yeah, Mary. Oh, you're on mute, Mary. Mary, you're on mute. I'll, I'll unmute you. Okay, because I, I lost my little icon there. Um, with Richard and, um, and Gary were talking, it made me think about a song, uh, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, because they have a T-shirt that generates a lot of uh, conversation sometimes about strangely dim. And so my neighbor and I got into the conversation, and, and we, um, we both agreed that, you know, if we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, you know, all of this, sometimes, I, I, you know, because I, I focus too much on the world and the troubles and, and everything, and makes it seem, you know, things seem like it's worse than it really is. But when I try to keep my focus, when I know where my focus lies, it, it makes life a little bit easier for me. There you go. There you go. I, that sounds good. I agree. Um, David? Yeah, Jeannie. Um... Paul um, is a very complex writer to me, um, and, and starting out with this kind of argument, I mean, my tendency is to go, well, duh, you know, but as we're discussing all this, I'm remembering who his initial audience was, and it's, it's the Jews. And yes, they have been Christians maybe for months, maybe years, I'm not sure, but a very, yeah, a very small amount of time, and their heritage was to sacrifice temporarily to clear their, their standing with God, and the sins would be rolled forward, but they would never really go away, and um, they also, it's my understanding, but, it, but um, I'm thinking that they never really did have a clear cut um, idea of living with God eternally. That I don't think that they they had that concept of of life after death with God. But anyway, um, I, and I guess when I remember that, then I can kind of accept more of what all he's saying and, and trying to get them to be um, aligned with the fact that, you know, we have a new life while we're alive. We're actually given, our faith gives us a whole new life, which was such a foreign concept to them. You know, with us, we've talked about it for, you know, all our life <laughs> as, as Christians. But, you know, these people, not so much. Yep, I would agree. Yeah, Dan. To go along with what Jeannie is saying, Paul is really addressing a sect of Judaism here called the holistic Jews who taught that I am covered by grace and I can live any way I want to live. Mm. No matter what I do, I will be saved because I have the grace of God through Christ. So he's actually addressing uh, <laughs> that I think may be a popular concept today too. Yep. Yeah, that's kind of the once saved, always saved uh, uh, kind of concept, right? Yes, yes, good points, everybody. Yes, yes. And Jeannie, we're going to kind of dive into uh, some of your points a little bit later. Thank you. All right, let's go to verses 5 and 6. For if we have become planted together to the likeness of his death, so also will should be of the rising again. This knowing that our old self was crucified with him, that the body of the sin may be made useless, for no longer serving the sin. Okay, so did Paul just say that we are no longer sinners? Is that what he said? No. No, what did he say? Yes. He said we are no longer slaves to sin. Yeah, or serving sin. Exactly, yes, exactly. But he did not say that we're no longer certain we're no longer sinners, right? Okay, All right. so what do you think he means that we are no longer serving sin? Yeah, Tom, and then Dan. Sin is no longer sin is no longer our master. Dead men are freed from their master, 
and our sins have been crucified through our baptism in Christ. So now we are to live in a newness of life. We no longer have the master of sin. Yes. Dan? Tom said it for me. <laughs> okay. All right. Did the mind meld thing here? Okay. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm just going to say the other the the dump dump on that is that we serve God, right? So we don't serve sin anymore. We serve God, right? All right. Verses seven and eight. For he who hath died has been set free from the sin, and if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Okay. This is living with him. Is that now? Is that in the life after in heaven? What What is that? In this context, that's another yes. That's another yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so if we don't live with him now, would he? Would we really know him? And more importantly, would he know us? Okay, let's go back. You can flip there or not. If you don't, I'm going to read it anyway. Uh, Matthew seven twenty one through 23. Not everyone who is saying to me, Lord, Lord, shall come into the reign of the heavens. But he was doing the will of my Father who was in the heavens. Okay, Many of us, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we have not, or have we not in thy name prophesied? And in thy name cast out demons? And in thy name done many mighty things? And then I will acknowledge to them that I never knew you. Depart from me who were working lawlessness. So um, basically, we need to know Christ so that he can know us. I mean, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but I think that's a, that's a key thing here. Any other thoughts on those couple of verses there? Okay, let's go to 9 through 11. Knowing that Christ, having been raised up out of the dead, does no more die, death has no more, uh, death no more has, has lordship over him. For in that he died to the sin, he died once, and that he lives, he lives to God. So also you reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to the sin and living to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. What does it mean for Christ and or us to live to God? What does that mean to live to God? Yeah, Dan. He lives to please God, to honor God, and to serve God. I like that. Anybody have anything else? I got a cu couple of permutations on that, I guess. Um, live in relationship with God. Uh, Dan said live to serve. Okay. And live in a God-like, Christ-like manner, right? Um, you know, a number of years ago, it became popular where those those bands that said, what would Jesus do, right? Um, basically trying to make, you know, make ourselves do what Jesus would do. All right, let's go to verses 12 through 14. Let not then the sin reign in your mortal body to obey, obey it its, its desires. Neither present you and your members instruments of unrighteousness to the sin, but present yourselves to God as living out of the dead and your members instruments of righteousness to God. For sin over you shall not have lordship, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay, so hold your seats, everybody. I'm going to shock you. I actually prefer the NIV verses here than almost any other translation. <laughs> I, you all probably hear me say that very often. In fact, you may never hear me say that again. Okay, But I'm going to read verses 13 um, and 14 um, from the NIV. Um, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and offer every part of yourself to him as an interest, instrument of righteousness. For sin shall have no longer, I'm sorry, for sin shall no longer be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. All right, so what are the implications of the word offer in this translation? Do not offer any part of yourself, blah, et cetera, et cetera. I see two dynamics that play off the bat. One is voluntary, and the other is control. Um, if you're offering something, it, it's something that you give on your own, and it, but yet it's also something that you you have control over the ability to make this offering. So it's not like you've been you've been captivated and you have no free will left. Uh, you, can, you still have the ability to offer yourself, just as even as a believer, you have an you have the free will to turn back and to let sin retake control. 
Yes, yes. For that matter, as a believer, you have every freedom to become an unbeliever if you want, right? I don't recommend it, but you can. Yeah, Tom. Uh, it brings to mind uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, to bring, present our bodies as a, as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And this is our true and proper worship, you know. It says, do not conform to this pattern of the world, but transform by the renewing of your mind to be able to test and approve what God's will is, good, pleasing, perfect will. That's what it means to me. It means that, you know, I can present my body as a living sacrifice, dead to sin, and presenting myself as that living sacrifice. Yes, thank you both. That's, I, those are the bookends. <laughs> I think that really nails nails that that, that bit there, right? Um, but I will also point something out here in the old law, right? The Hebrews offered what dead animals, grain, and other things as a sacrifice to God, right? Um, what does He ask us to do? He asks us to offer what ourselves, right? He doesn't want some dead animal. He doesn't want some dead animal's blood. He doesn't want some ground up wheat or rye or whatever. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, he wants us to offer ourselves our entire being, not just Sundays, not just when I pray. He wants he wants me hook, line, and sinker. He wants me to sell out totally, right? Um, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is because I, this isn't a trivial thing. I think this is huge. This is this is a very important part of this message, and and the Bible in general is that the only way to really really proceed in this life as a Christian is 100 percent all out. And and really with all of our being. Not easy to do, by the way. <laughs> Certainly haven't perfected that myself. If you have, please let me know the secret because I haven't got there. Um, but anyway, I think I think that's a real key uh, message here. Anything else on those verses? By the way, you can all pick yourselves up off the floor that I quoted the NIV, so we we can move on. Have you on recording, David? For yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, well, I recorded it myself, so it's right there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Verses 15 through 18. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Let it not be. Have you not heard that to whom you present yourselves servants for obedience, servants you are to him whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? And thanks to God that you were servants of the sin and were obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were delivered up. And having been freed from the sin, you became servants to the righteousness. Okay, so this reminds me um, a little bit of Christ speaking to us in Matthew 6, verses, uh, verse 24. Um, uh, basically, it says, None is able to serve two lords. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold the, to the other and despise the other. You're not able to serve God in them. Um, I think that's a very complimentary kind of thought process here. Okay, so by the way, as you also all know, um, I like to ask rhetorical questions. I will point out that I had a good teacher. Um, if you look at uh, verse 15 and actually about a third of the, you know, three other uh, verses in this thing, Paul is asking a rhetorical question, right? He doesn't actually really think that, it, you know, anybody is going to believe that, uh, that they should go out and sin more because they're under grace now, right? Um, he certainly hopes that they will. Okay. Also, note that Paul uses words like servant and obedient and death and righteousness here. I don't think these are just a random choice of words. These are thematic concepts throughout Romans and much of Paul's writing. I think he's really he's really nailing it in here. Okay, he's really he's starting to drill deep in now. Um, so I like how Paul puts this. He doesn't say we have or uh, or have, he doesn't say that we have or have earned righteousness. He says that we have become servants to righteousness. So, um, first of all, I'd like to know if you agree with that, but also, who is really righteous? And if, if we serve righteousness, who is righteousness? What is he talking about there? God, God right? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know. I didn't spend that much time looking at the other translations on this, right? But it says that you can either be servants of sin or servants to the righteousness, which is really the same thing as saying servants to God, right? Any other thoughts on those verses? All right. Oh, yeah, Dan, go ahead. You know, verse 15 is a, a warning to copping out for grace. You know, 
I know this is wrong. I'm going to do it because God makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yes, that's 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 all part of the, the maturation process, right? It's real that you know. If I'm if I claim to be a Christian, if I want to be a Christian, if I if I am a Christian, I really have to live that, right? I have to do the best I can to imbue that in, in every action and every every way I approach everything I do. Okay, verses 19 through the end of the chapter, there 23, and I want you to. Okay, in the manner of men I speak. Okay, so this is Paul t uh, talking to this audience that Dan was describing earlier of Jews who largely believe that they're basically the, you know, once saved, always saved, I can now go off and do anything I want, right? Um, so in the manner of men I speak, because of the weakness of your flesh, or even as you did present your members' servants to the uncleanliness and to the lawlessness, to the lawlessness, so now present your members' servants to the righteousness, to sanctification. For when you were servants of the sin, you were free from the righteousness. What fruit, for, therefore, were you having then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those is death. And now, having been freed from the sin and having become servants to God, you have your fruit to sanctification and the end life age during. For the wages of sin is death and the gift of life is life age during in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so I'm going to point out that Paul says in verse 21 something to the effect of, of which you are now ashamed. And depending on your translation, and also in verse 19, which is before that, something like, in the manner of men I speak. I would say that we are not supposed to feel ashamed for our sins of the past. We're to repent, ask for forgiveness, be obedient to God, and then move on. I think what Paul is addressing here is the way that we typically act and think, however, particularly the people that he was writing to. In verse 22, he makes it very clear that we've been freed from sin as we become servants to God. Not when we say that we become servants to God, but when we become servants to God. And of course, verses 23 is a very famous verse, the ways of sin is death and the gift of God, God is life age during Christ Jesus our Lord. So what are the implications of Christians of the wages of sin is death. Is it meaningless? Is Paul only talking to non-believers? Will we be condemned uh, to eternal death for any sins committed after baptism? Are we free to commit sins because after we become baptized, our sins have been forgiven? What is Paul's message here? Yeah, Dan. I think it's partly the folly of sin. What has sin ever accomplished for anyone? Very good. Very good. Yes. Thank you. That's great. Yes. Right. Um, any other thoughts on that? I, w I would just uh, tag on to that by saying sin has its natural outcome. Um, even as followers of Jesus Christ, if we, if we engage in, in sinful activity, it's going to have its natural end. And, and, and there's going to be some type of, of death that's going to take place, maybe not a physical death, uh, or, but there might be a part of me that dies. There might be a, um, a, a something in, in my, my approach to the way I, I see life that might die. Um, sin never has a good outcome. Excellent, excellent. Yes, because although we may be forgiven, let me not say, although we are forgiven our sins, that doesn't mean there aren't consequences, particularly here in this life, right? And, and I like that, that mindset that Mike just uh, proposed, which is that little parts of us can die. It can be a relationship, that, you know? We had a good relationship with somebody, and now it's thinner because they don't trust us or whatever. Yeah, Mary, go ahead. And then Tom. That made me think about David. You know, a, guy, a man after God's own heart. But David, you know, when he sinned, uh, even though you know he uh, he he, he uh, you know became contrite and 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 asked for forgiveness, but he still suffered the consequences of all his actions. Yes, he did. Yeah, Tom, are you still there? You kind of faded out on us there. Yeah, it, it keeps going in and out as far as uh, you know the connection. I think. Um, 
throughout this whole chapter, he doesn't say, I want to sin. He continues to warn of remaining in sin or getting back into sin. It will be active for everyone. That's just the way it is. All things are right for them now. What we need to do is not to get back into sin, not make it our master, because that would be voluntary slavery. We would be offering ourselves up to be the slaves to sin. So what we need to do is, as he is telling us, live in Jesus Christ, and then we don't have the results of that sin, which is very bad. There you go. There you go. By the way, I'll also I'll ask one of my rhetorical questions. If you voluntarily go into sin, are you really a slave to sin? Or are you a co-conspirator with sin? I would argue you're a co-conspirator with sin, right? Um, sometimes we kind of slide in there and we don't realize it, and I get that. But sometimes it's not so unconscious and so, at any rate, so um, sometimes it's, uh, it's more willing than that, okay? All right, so I asked a bunch of obviously pretty rhetorical questions, and I think not, all of them were too simplistic, right? Um, yes, our salvation is based first and foremost on our faith in Christ, right? But our faith has to be real. If it's real, then we're not free to commit sin, okay? <laughs> um, well, we need to do our best to avoid it, and even when we do sin, we need to recognize, admit it, re uh, ask for forgiveness, and repent. And finally, and I'm looking out here, everyone here is a mature Christian, but I'm going to say this anyway. You know, I wish I could say this is all simple and easy to do, but we all know it isn't, right? Um, life is messy. Being a Christian is even messier. It can be confusing. Um, it can be down right hard sometimes. But also, I think we also will agree, it's also the only way, right? <laughs> it may be the messy way, but there's really no better way, right? Um, okay, so at the beginning of our session tonight, I asked you to keep in the back of your mind the question and issue of what it means to be freed from sin and servants of God, as stated in verse 22. So having worked through this, what do you think? What do you think the relationship between being freed from sin and being a servant of God is? And is there an order here, or is there a chicken and egg thing, or what? Yeah, Dan. You know, being a servant of God, I think, kind of stems from our relationship and our knowledge of his grace and our freedom from sin. Uh, one drives the other. Yeah, so to, it's somewhat interesting. So it is a bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? It's not that, so I make myself serve, then I become, you know, it's, it's not that clean and crisp. It's, it's kind of a walking the, the walk as you go through it, right? There's a, um, there's a freedom from and a freedom for. Just like in a very real way, we're saved from sin, but we're saved to serve. Um, in a very real way, we're, we're free from sin, but we're free for righteousness. We're freed for uh, him, and, and we're freed for um, offering ourselves to him. And, and that's a, ultimately, uh, Jesus in John 8 said, if, if this is the kind of freedom you have, you are free indeed. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Yes, very good. Any other thoughts on that? I have one more wrap up, but any other thoughts on that? All right. So Christ's grace is offered to all. We have to accept it, right? And we have to accept it on his terms, not on, on our terms, right? I don't get to decide what God's terms are, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that God is God and I am not, and I don't get to decide how this works, right? So I have to accept God's offer on his terms. Good news is it's a really good offer, right? Um, it's like the best offer in town. You know, all you have to do is realize it, right? Um, okay. Um, so basically, I'll, re I'll kind of recap where we've been. So we need to continually mature and repent of our sins, peel back the onion, get to the next level, so forth. We need to look to our sins differently than we used to or than, we, than if we weren't Christians. We need to look at our sins and the sins of others as Jesus would, not as the world does. When we're baptized, we're baptized into both Christ's death and his resurrection. Our old self, our old way of being in sin and looking at sin is dead. We put it behind us. We're a new entity, as Mike said. 
Uh, yet our sins have been washed away, but more importantly, we have an opportunity to be in relationship with God. I just can't imagine a better offer in, in the world. We need to live with Christ now and then to get to live with him for eternity in heaven. Uh, we need to live in relationship with God. Uh, we, we need to live to serve God. Um, uh, life in a, is a godlike, uh, or live in a godlike, Christ-like manner. We need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, as Tom said. Present yourself as a, as a serve, uh, self-offering to God. Unlike under the old law, where we you know, offer dead animals, grain, and other things to sacrifice, we've been called to offer ourselves, our entire being. And this isn't a small thing, this is huge. All right, then we as Christians, we are not earned righteousness. We have become servants to righteousness, and our righteousness is given to us by God through his grace. And then finally, our faith has to be real. If it's real, um, then we are not free to commit sins. We need to do our best to avoid sins, and, we, and even when we do sin, we need to recognize, admit it, ask forgiveness, and repent. Any other thoughts? All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, pray uh, ourselves out, and then um, we'll do Chapter 7 next week. So if you'll all bow with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for the lively conversation. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for your word and all it means to us and all the guidance that it provides us. As we go through t tonight, tomorrow, the rest of the week, the rest of our lives, may we always take your word on our hearts, on our lips, and on our minds, and may we present your light to the world. In your son's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night, brothers and sisters. Good night. Good night, Good night. David. Thank you, brother. Thank you.